we're looking at the pre-Socratic philosopher Thales. And in part one, we're providing some background for his work that's pretty important to understanding his significance. And then we'll consider his four main theses and take a careful look at the first theses. And then in part two, we'll look at the remaining three theses. So just a, a broad background, this is the lo location where Thales lived and worked. He's from the town of Miletus. You see that on the right here on the coast of what is modern day Turkey. So Greece is in the middle, it's the orange part, and you can see Athens almost in the direct middle of that map. And we have the background dates of Miletus from 624 to 545, approximately uh, BC, those are his dates. And there's a story about Thales, a couple stories about Thales that are significant. One is that he was able to predict a solar eclipse without any telescope. And we have a specific date uh, for that extrapolating backwards. So that was May 28th, 585 BC. And Thales predicted that solar eclipse. We'll talk about its significance in just a moment, but another story was that he was staring up into the stars and he wasn't paying attention of where he was walking and he fell into a well. And so he was mocked by the children of the neighborhood. Okay, let's consider more. Why is it important that Thales is able to predict a solar eclipse? Think about the context of his culture. A solar eclipse would have been something that was probably terrifying. You didn't know when it was going to happen and you didn't know why it was happening. So most people considered it the result of an angry God, right? Just bringing darkness to an area or some other supernatural occurrence. And the fact that Thales is able to predict the eclipse is pretty significant. It means that the world is predictable, that there's a rational basis for it. Now, he was mocked for having his face up in the sky and falling into a well and just kind of being useless. And uh, so just a, a quick tangent here, you can see on this chart uh, from a few years back, uh, philosophy majors, what are their mid-career salaries and how does that compare with people who majored in natural sciences like chemistry or businesses like uh, business degrees like marketing and accounting or professional degree like nursing and uh, so on, you see the, the differences there. So it's actually still true today that if philosophers set their minds to it, they are able to make money. That's typically not the priority for someone in philosophy, but the skills that you learn by studying philosophy, the critical reasoning skills, the clear writing skills, the verbal communication skills, the problem solving skills. These are extremely valuable in the business realm. And so they are rewarded when somebody has developed those skills by studying philosophy. What Thales did was he actually went back and, and to show the people that he could make money if he wanted to. He actually bought up a a bunch of olive presses and then he had the rights to them and then he was able to sell them out when it was in season and he made a large profit. But well, that's not the main part of the philosophy, the Thales that we want to emphasize. So what are we concerned with? Well, change is a topic that drives a lot of these pre-Socratic philosophers. Thales is considered the first Western philosopher, the first pre-Socratic philosopher. And one thing that drove his desire to understand things is the cases of change in the world. And, and the idea that, well, something has to persist that underlies changes that we observe. So, for example, consider the changes of a tree growing from a seed. So it's a seed and then it's a sapling, it has leaves, 
the leaves are green, then they're orange, and then brown, and then the tree lacks the leaves if it's a deciduous tree, and then it buds again the next year, it gets taller, and so on. Think of all those changes. Well, there are going to be many incompatible properties in the process. So is the tree of, say, January 2024 the same as the tree of, say, June of 2028? One has leaves, one does not. One's leaves are green, one does not. One is taller than the other. You have these incompatible properties. So could you say it's really the same tree? That seems to be problematic. And so maybe there's something else that the thing that really is the thing, something that is existing that persists through all those changes. And for Thales, change is a concern of his, but there are other philosophical issues that he wants to address. Now, unfortunately for Thales' writings, they are no longer available. So what we know about Thales comes from others' testimony. And primarily what we know about Thales comes from Aristotle. And Aristotle attributes the following four views or theses to Thales. One is that water is the arche of all things, the originating principle. I'll say more about this word in a moment. And we get that from Aristotle's work called the metaphysics. And we see references to Aristotle's work for all four of these theses. So the second thesis, the earth rests on water. So water is part of the first two theses. Now for the third thesis, it might seem a little bit odd for a philosopher to say this, but all things are full of gods. We'll explore this in part two. And then finally, the magnet has a soul. Again, from Aristotle's writings, that's Aristotle is attributing these theses to Thales from there. So we'll explore two through four more carefully in part two. Now, what makes these views philosophically interesting or scientifically interesting? Let's take them one by one. So let's consider this first and most important claim of Thales. Water is the arche of all things. Now, first, we need to address this word arche. It is transliterated from the Greek, which means we find a corresponding letter in English to the Greek letters. Uh, so we have A for the alpha, R for the rho. For the chi, we have CH, and then for the eta and E. And so we pronounce that RK. And what is this word? Well, RK means the beginning of something or the source of something, or, or a good way of defining it for the way the pre-Socratics use it, is as the first principle or even originating principle of something. And we use this root in some of the English words that you might be familiar with, of course you're familiar with, archaeology, for example, architect, those come from this root in the, in the Greek. And so let's think about architect, right? The, an architect is the one who originates the design for a building. And so without the architect, right, the building doesn't exist. It's that first, the architect provides that first source, the originating source for a, a building or a structure. What Thales is especially concerned about is a material arche. So a material arche then is what we're concerned about is not necessarily supernatural or unnatural, but he's talking about either the stuff, the material stuff from which something originated, or possibly he's talking about the stuff of which something is currently composed. And so both of these are alternatives. Either Thales thought that 
everything originated in water and was doing what we call cosmogony, which is identifying the originating source of everything that exists. And Thales being on a coastal area with islands around and depending on the sea for trade and for food, you could see why water would be so important. So maybe he thought that everything that exists came from water. That would be to understand his first thesis is in terms of doing a cosmogony. But there is an alternative. Possibly he was providing what we might call a constituent analysis. So he was making the claim that everything that currently exists is now actually made of water. That would be providing a constituent analysis. So those are two different ways of thinking about what Thales is up to and the other pre-Socratics when they are identifying the Arche, as we'll see with Anaximenes and Anaximander, for example, they are doing one of these two things as well. And often we consider it to be a constituent analysis, but we also have reason to think it's cosmogony in some of the fragments. So again, the thesis, water is the Arche of all things. So maybe he actually intended to do both a cosmogony and provide a constituent analysis. Now, Aristotle speculates on the motive to say that water is the arche of all things, that maybe that motive is due to the moist nature of living things. For Aristotle, living things are especially significant and important to his metaphysics. And all living things require water and so Aristotle says that maybe that is the reason that, that Thales is making this claim that water is the arche of all things. Okay, we have three other theses to consider, and we'll do that in part two.